Hey, this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast, where we talk with some of the most successful engineering leaders who reveal actionable management insights that help you take your developer team to the next level. This episode is brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications from design to delivery with React, Node.js, and Angular. Check them out at CodingSans.com. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the Level Up Engineering Podcast. I am Carolina Tot, and as always, I am your host. And before we start with my guest, who is James Trunk, I will let you know on a little secret, which is not so much of a secret, uh, that if you go to CodingSense.com and sign up for our newsletter, you will get every episode two weeks prior to the rest of the world getting the episode. So it's a good deal. Go over to CodingSense.com and sign up for our newsletter to level up your leadership skills. With that said, I interview really accomplished technology leaders bi-weekly, and my guest today is James Trunk, who is the VP of Engineering at Griffin. And so without further ado, welcome, James. Thank you. And please tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, what your passions are, what we should know about you. Yeah, that's, that's a broad topic. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. So James, who is he? Um, so I, I lead software teams, teams that build digital products. I've been doing that for a while now, but maybe it's interesting to go a bit further back, uh, the start of my career, basically. So I started being a software developer, uh, mainly backend Java work. This is 20 years ago we're talking about now. So cast your mind's eye back to what the world was like back then. It was a bit different, especially in terms of technology stacks and things. I uh, started in a startup, um, got hooked on the, so my very first job after university studying computer science, uh, software engineering, uh, was a startup, uh, the highs and the lows of that and addicted to the pace and the impact you can make, um, had a couple of jobs in bigger corporations, uh, also in telecommunications, uh, still doing mainly Java type stuff. Um, seeing how different that is and how much of a smaller cog in the machine you are, but with other benefits that come with it. Uh, I definitely recommend people that have just been stuck in one or other of those, either just startups or just big corporates, try the other one. You really learn a lot about yourself and about other people. Um, then I moved to Sweden. Uh, so I, I, I'm from the UK originally, but I moved to Sweden. I fell in love and moved here. And um, my first job here was another startup, also telco, very exciting. I learned a lot about XP. Agile was really hot back then. It was brand new, basically. Um, I was still not, not, not a leader role, just, just, just the developer. Um, and then my second job in Sweden was at the stock exchange. And there I sort of got thrust into my first leadership position because I was on a small team that was all consultants and NASDAQ, OMX, the, the company, they had a policy that only full-time employees could lead teams. So even though I was really quite young and probably totally underprepared, or I definitely was underprepared, uh, I was kind of thrust into a leadership role, just trying to find my way as you do when you're starting, you know, to make that transition, trying to figure out how much programming to do versus how much leadership and process. Um, it was just around that time that Scrum and Agile was really sort of taking off. Henrik Knieberg, a Swedish guy, had written a book about it called Scrum in the Trenches or From the Trenches. And I'd gotten really into that um, and suggested to my manager we should try it. So we tried it in our team. I kind of sold him on it. Uh, and then it kind of spread to this whole project. We were working on a next generation trading platform and it spread to the whole project. And I was sort of coaching some other teams. I think they saw the, you know, the big board on the wall and back then that was cool and different and people were like, well, what's going on? Um, so that was fun because I got to see how you can make a change, even at a big kind of corporate place. Uh, if you have good ideas and you sell it in the right way, I kind of got lucky in that way that I saw the impact that you could have. Um, then I decided to become a consultant. Uh, I was the world's least successful consultant because I had one company that I worked for and I ended up staying there six years. They turned me into an employee pretty quickly. Uh, that was a startup journey to, to a kind of big company. We started in a little apartment in a part of Stockholm that was turned into like a mini office. And then we grew and grew and grew to the point where when I left, 
we were two floors of a skyscraper is that kind of journey so i did a lot of leadership development there I had an awesome line manager that gave me a lot of support let me get involved with recruitment which of course we were doing a lot because we were growing trying different agile techniques um did a bit of product ownership there for the first time, sort of learning how to build the right thing, as well as what I'd kind of learned before about building things right. Uh, and I fell in love with Clojure, the language while I was there. So it was a really formative uh, six years. Uh, since then, I've done a bit more product and then taken that into sort of higher level leadership roles. I had my first CTO role at a recruitment company. Uh, the, the thing I'm proudest of there is building a new way of doing backend architecture that we actually open sourced called Polylith that I'm super proud of. And you talked about side projects. I still do a little bit of those, mainly my friend Joachim that's pushing that awesome thing forward. It's starting to take off a bit in the closure community, which is really exciting. I think it's it's actually um, a competitive advantage to use it. It's, a, it's an idea that's that good. So I can definitely recommend people check that out. Uh, and recently, uh, I'll skip over. I did a year in an investment bank doing a lot of PowerPoints and pre-investment and a bit of coaching. I've done quite a bit of coaching. Um, I have a kind of coaching leadership style now, I guess you could say. And most recently at Griffin, I'm at this awesome trying to become a bank uh, startup in the fintech world based out of the UK, but I'm still here in Stockholm, but, so it's remote. And uh, yeah, the, the challenges of leading people when you don't get to see them very often. Uh, so that's me in a nutshell. Thank you so much. That was quite the introduction and we will have context from where you're going, which is awesome. Um, thank you for that. Um, with that said, we are going over to our topic and today our topic is decision principles. And I think every leader should know about decision principles because when we are young, we are usually just making decisions on a hunch. And then as we grow, sometimes we learn that um, our hunches are not always the best. Um, so first of all, let's get our things straight and let's be on the same page with uh, all of our watchers and listeners. How do you define the idea of decision principles? What are we talking about in your understanding? Yeah, I think you summarized it quite nicely. The basic idea is to codify the learnings that you've made into something that's a bit crisper, a bit clearer, you know, with clear language that's easier to remember with the I idea being that, I don't know if other people have, have experienced this, but, you know, you learn a lot over your career, you in different situations and you sort of see how to do things well and what to avoid. But it's quite easy if you don't have a bit of a system around that to to make the same mistakes again basically so it's it's some kind of a tool in your toolkit mm. to try and avoid making the same mistakes again it's it's a way of clarifying how you communicate what you value and what your principles are to other people so it's some kind of an enabler of working more efficiently and effectively together um, and, and a little bit even about common alignment we, we can talk a bit more about that later and how it's not amazing at that, um, but it can be useful in some situations with that too, about pushing in the same direction and being on the same page. Um, so that's basically what it, it is. It's heuristics for, for making better decisions. And, um, sh should I, should I go through and tell you my decision principles just so it doesn't seem academic and, and sort of ethereal for people <laughs> without context. Yeah. yeah, sure. Let's talk about your decision principles. Yeah. First of all, yes, I have quite a few. I, I don't want to go through the meaning of them in detail, but the, the basic formulation of them is, uh, X over Y where X is the preferred thing. The thing that you've seen that works well and the Y is a bit of a gotcha or a, a potential, um, blind alley or a p potential problems. Um, they're not as black and white as that. Um, but anyway, so my list is simple over easy, uh, long-term over short-term fast feedback over silent failure, experiment over opinion, uh, focus over context switching. I have quite a few, as you can tell, uh, I, I think I should maybe pare it down to a few less, but anyway, it's learning over stagnation, transparency over tribes, a trust over micromanagement. And the last one is innovation over safe bets. And, and they've all come over time. Like they didn't come all at once out of nowhere. They've come over time from 
reflecting on what's gone well and what's gone less well and even subsequently after that what has helped me to make better decisions and what hasn't so it kind of it's something that changes over time and you i kind of keep track as as they change and as it grows um and yeah that's the basic idea okay so um, with that said <clears throat> you already talked about how decision principles are things that help you align to your values mm -hmm. i think you said something yeah. like that um i am thinking your decision principles help us look into your world a little For bit sure. and so i venture to ask whether or not your decision principles can be used anywhere and everywhere or whether there are certain situations where your decision principles might not be the best decision principles, specifically when you said innovation over safe paths. Dearest listeners, I think I can scientifically say that women are usually the people who are safe betters. So maybe it's coming from my biology that I picked up this one, but, um, Innovation over safe bets maybe sounds like, you know, your startup brain thinking mm -hmm. and, and it's really, you know, like I, I kind of agree that innovation should always be or aim, but sometimes there are situations where safe bets might be the better choice. Yes, what absolutely. You and I, Carolina, I think you've hit on a great point there. And that is that even though it's normally prefer X over Y. So normally prefer, I would say for myself, normally prefer innovation over safe bets. That doesn't mean that you should be black and white in this and always go with the first one. It's more to, to make me stop and think and reflect and say, is this the right way to go? If we just pick safe bet after safe bet after safe bet after safe bet, are we going to be making enough of a competitive advantage for ourselves that we can succeed as a startup? But like you're saying, if you're in a different situation, if you're in a different organization where safe bets are the right thing for your career, absolutely. And I don't think these, my principles are generally applicable. I don't think people should copy paste my ones as some kind of, this is, you know, genius. This is the right way to make decisions. These are based on my learnings. I guess what I would pr be proposing as a potential toolkit for people that are interested is go through a similar process yourself to figure out your own principles. And, and whether you use the X over Y or some other approach, that's up to you. That's worked pretty well for me. Um, but, and maybe some of them like, you know, long-term over short-term, I think it's kind of hard to argue against that as a general principle, but I can definitely see some of mine that are more um, controversial and that are less generally applicable. So I think you are a hundred percent correct. Thank you. I, I wasn't going for being correct, but thank you for that uh, point. Um, we already got into the kind of the juicy parts, but, um, first of all, let's just say your decision principles are your mm -hmm. own and there are many other kinds of decision principles out there. How come you decided to create your own? What was your sort of thought process or situation or circumstance that maybe led you to the understanding that you need your own decision principles? Good question. It, it all started when I had a product owner role in a TV streaming company. So I was running, um, a small team that grew a little bit on, under my leadership and we had an awesome agile coach. I was. Yeah, I was the product owner, um, but we had this agile coach that sort of floated around different teams and she was helping us. And we were putting our heads together to try and increase the team's alignment. And at the time it was really trendy with doing value workshops. Um, maybe it still is, I'm not sure. But anyway, we thought, oh, that could be an interesting idea. See what shared values we have as a team, try and get this alignment. Uh, so we put our heads together and we're trying to figure out how to run that workshop in a good way uh, and try and sort of set it up for success. And I can't remember which one of us came up with the idea, but we, we decided to steal directly from the agile manifesto because they have this X over Y, you know, people over process kind of formulation for their, 
their principles. And we thought, ah, oh, that's good because, and the reason why I think that's better than just having a single word, I don't, I guess most companies that have values, you know, it's values about community or innovation or, and those single words don't tend to really help in my experience with decision-making. It's just a nice word. We know that's a good thing. We know we should be aiming for it. But the reason why X over Y helps is because it helps you spot from both sides of the coin, you know, from the, the flip side of it. Uh, so we, we came up with a list, I think five or six as a team that we could kind of all agree on that we shared that these were important and it helped the team a little bit. I don't want to oversell. I, I'm not fully convinced about values. I think in t at least in terms of teams, because I think people have their own values. They have their own principles that they bring as a person. Uh, but you can't give someone else your values. They have the values that they have. Uh, so it could be valuable to figure out, well, where are our common values? Uh, I think the other way that's valuable is if you set that up before you hire people. So if you're a founder and you say, well, my values are X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C, and then you recruit people who have similar values to you, I think that can work very well. Uh, but starting with an existing group of people and trying to force values on them, I don't think is that great. So anyway, back to the story, I feel like I'm waffling here, but so the story was we came out of this workshop, we had these values, we talked about them a bit when we were making decisions. It never really took off in the team. It wasn't something that changed the way we worked, but I keep a daily work diary at the end of each day. I spend 15 minutes reflecting back on the day and sort of use it as a bookend and plan a bit for the next day. Um, and I found myself reflecting quite a lot on those decision principles and how it was helping me make decisions, leadership decisions or team decisions, how it was giving me a language to communicate. So I don't know exactly when, maybe if I look back in my work diary, I'll see the exact date, but I just thought I can turn these into my values rather than the team values and sort of see how much value I get from that. And I did that for a while. And then over time, like I said, I adjusted them based on more reflection, added, removed, added some more. Now I have quite a few, I have nine. Um, and it got to the point where I realized, well, these aren't so much just about values. I mean, they are value based, but they're about helping me to make better decisions and to communicate those. So that's when I sort of flipped the name to decision principles. So that's basically the birth of the idea. And I don't know if it's an original idea. I don't think I'd read about anyone else calling things decision principles, but you know how it is when you come up with an idea, it's normally some, somebody else has already done it. So that, that may well be the case. Right. Right. <clears throat> okay. Um, so you, you had this team and then you moved on to work with another team, but you were already going away from the team with your own kind of decision principles. Right. And I guess we can all agree that values are kind of the, the bigger cup and then within values we have decisions which is how we navigate our everyday lives how did you use your now founded decision principles when you went on to work with the new team mm -hmm. did you kind of start with the values workshop with them too or or did you just kind of share your decision principles how did you introduce them to this idea yeah I'd, I'd soured a little bit on on the values you know for the reasons that i talked about before so i actually just shared them as here's a good way to find out more about me how i think uh, I, I think i use the phrase it's the konami code to my brain uh for if you're trying to sell me on an idea if you can say well james here's where it's simple rather than easy or here's where it's a long-term idea you know you know how to sort of get my attention with that and that has happened quite a few times in my career so it's not so much about forcing other people to think that way it's about saying that's the way my brain works those are the things i value here's why i value them basically um, so I used to do a PowerPoint presentation with some nice pictures to help people remember them, you know, the, the actual phrases. And it's not, I'm not trying to drill it into them so that they can sort of list off all of James, James's decision principles. It's more that when we're having a discussion, I might pipe in and say, oh yeah, that that's definitely, uh, that's simple. I like that. Or that that's, um, that's something where we should experiment over just using our opinions and just just through that repetition, I think people start to sort of pick up on them through osmosis in terms of understanding. And I think sometimes people realize, well, that overlaps with my values. I should either take that wording that James uses or come up with my own one. And, and you see, it does change how decision, 
thinking happens within the team. Uh, and subsequently since then, because I've joined a few other companies since then, I, I've gotten to the point now that I actually write about them in my manager read me. I don't know if you know about that trend, but it's about writing about yourself so that if you're in a remote team, people can get to know you by reading. Uh, so part of my read me is going through giving examples, explaining why I have them and where they came from, basically, uh, again, in a getting to know James kind of mindset. Awesome. Thank you. I was kind of thinking it's like a user manual to James, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I have that with my team. It's just kind of like a one pager of really what some of my values might be or how I approach my job or, or approach other people or for example, common misunderstandings about yes. me, like, you know, like I'm really outgoing and this might seem like it's a, it's a, it's for show, but really like, I just like being around people and that really energizes me when we can have really good conversation. Um, and, and so a user manual is kind of what I would call mm -hmm. it, but a read me or a getting to know someone is also really good and useful. And I'm glad to hear that other people are doing that too. Um, with that said, if we have some listeners, we have quite a few listeners, luckily listeners, thank you for being here with us. Um, and they don't have their own decision principles yeah. yet. Would you recommend that they sit down and try to drill down what they think their own decision principles might be? Or would you recommend that they sit down with their team perhaps and say, listen, I just had this great idea from a podcast. Let's create our own decision principles. That's a great question. And I'm not sure what I feel about the answer. Um, I think both could have value. I mean, my initial principles were seeded, you know, started by doing that kind of team brainstorming and, you know, it wasn't all my ideas out of thin air. It was from getting other people's insights and ideas. So that could be definitely valuable. And that also has the added value that you do figure out where you have common values. My suggestion might be that if you do start that way, don't just stop there because you might have other values that weren't shared by the whole team that are really important to you, that you want to shape how you make decisions. And I think the only way to come to that conclusion is to spend time reflecting on yourself and how you think and your past. Uh, and that's where the, this work diary practice or habit comes in incredibly handy. But even if you just do, you know, a weekly or a monthly reflection, I think this could be one of the things that you reflect on and think about. Um, I definitely think it's valuable. Yes. So uh, I guess the answer to your Thank question you. is a combination of the two was probably pretty ideal. Oh, yeah, which is usually the answer to all things. Yeah. Uh, we, I, I think we already established that things are not black mm -hmm. and white and, um, and we can, we can generally agree on that. I would like to, I know I'm the interviewer and I should be keeping things on track, but I am just so intrigued by your, your diary habits. And increasingly I find that when I interview people, one of the most important traits of a good leader is being self-reflective mm -hmm. and being very observant of one's surroundings and one's own self. So. Could you just share what really is your diary habit and, and how do you go about it? Absolutely. So I started it almost a decade ago. Now it was while I was, while I was still a product owner at that company that was blowing up, you know, where I, I had a lot of growth at that company. And I think I just watched a Ted talk or something. And there was some doctor, I can't remember her name. I'm sure it's in my first diary entry. Uh, who said, oh, lots of successful people do it. Here are the values of it. Here's what you get out of it. And what I'd noticed at the time was, you know, I'd, I'd been doing leadership a little while and, you know, decision-making and everything, but I, I noticed that I missed, and this is going back to one of my principles now, but I missed the fast feedback. When you're a developer, if you make a mistake, the compiler tells you straight away, or your test suite tells you pretty quickly, or, you know, when you're integrating with your continuous integration system, or your colleagues will give you a code review, right? But when you're a leader, you make decisions, they're quite important, they impact other people, they impact the direction of the product or the process. But if you're not careful, you can go a long time without getting feedback on it. 
And that's sort of the trigger. I was thinking, well, there's this outside trigger of somebody suggesting it. Here's a little structure you can use. Here's why it's good. And then I had that internal yearning for more reflection so I could have a faster internal feedback loop. And of course, internal feedback is not the best kind of feedback. Really, you want feedback from the outside, from other, other people. And of course, I do request that too. But it's something where you can do it regularly. It's on you to do it. And I think you can generate a lot of insights from it. So that's kind of how the whole thing started. And I use this uh, format where I split it into four sections each day. The first one is progress. And there it's about jotting down decisions. That's really important. Any decisions that we make or that I make, I try and note because otherwise it's hard to reflect back on it. Um, one-to-ones, any one-to-ones or meeting outcomes, I jot down there too. Any big, big outcomes that are worth tracking. Uh, I have a section called clarity that I wish I'd called insights. Uh, where it's an insight or several normally that another person has had, either a teammate or somebody. Sometimes it's an insight I've had, you know, just a new way of thinking about things and try and capture that crisply. Uh, then I have a section about challenges, what's happening in the team, what are the little micro challenges that we're facing, which I then pull out to a more zoomed out top level challenges collection that I keep in, a, in another piece of software. Uh, and then finally, what's happening tomorrow? And that's like a bookend of the day. Is there anything that I haven't prepped for tomorrow? It's a really nice way to just finish the day and be ready for the next day. And I also add into that a bit of a weekly uh, setting a set of goals for the week. They're normally connected to those bigger challenges I was talking about. If there's a list of, say, six or seven top level challenges that I'm tackling right now, I'll try and figure out, well, which three of those would I like to make some progress on this week? And then I reflect on the Friday, how did that go? If it didn't go well, what could I have done differently? So that's the basic format of it. All right, thank you. And uh, please um, just share again, how this connects to your decision principles. What What is the connection here? How do you use them? Yeah, so the clarity section, the bit that I wish I called insight, that's normally when I'm reflecting on, ah, you know, we made a decision last week and it didn't turn out to be so good. Um, sometimes it can be in challenges too, but it's in, in reflecting and writing down either an insight or a clarity or a challenge. That's when I'm triggering that bit of my brain that's trying to pattern match on what's happened before, what decisions I've made. So it's quite often there that I'll write down Hmm, maybe this over this could be a potential uh, decision principle. And then I start mulling mm -hmm. it over. So it tends to be the diary that drives a change because that's the place where I'm writing and reflecting. And, right. and it's the, almost that dialogue with yourself that's refining the ideas. You know, the diary is, it's like communicating with someone. You're communicating with yourself. You know, I don't share it with anyone else. It's just for future me, basically. But it's still a kind of communication and I think that level of reflection and refinement really l lends itself to coming up with crisp things like decision principles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It sounds like um, it's a really clarified process. Um, and also, you know, you can still call it insights. I know. I don't know how know. long you have of your last diary. I should do that, right? I should just figure out how to find replace in day one and just fix it so that it's called insight. <laughs> You're right. I, I'll, I'll look into that. That's a good prod. Um, and with that said, I, I kind of feel like we have like a general image of how you came to the conclusion of these decision principles and how they are shared with any new team now when you join a new company. Um, how do you use them? What is the sort of process for a team that you're leading um, besides when they want to convince you of something, they kind of use the wording, right? But um, what is sort of the added value for the, the team? How, how can they utilize your decision principles? Yeah, so if... if it's the scenario where it, it's just me presenting them as my principles and nothing that we sort of come at together. You know, when we talked about this before, it felt like more of a collaborative process. That might be slightly different then because then you really can say, these are our shared values or principles, and this is what that means for us. Um, but in my situation where I'm just sharing them and saying, if you're interested, here's how my brain works. 
it's more that I I think I touched on this before, but it's about helping people realize the importance of decision making. You know, the fact that I've spent that much time mm -hmm. thinking about it, hopefully builds some confidence and trust that it doesn't mean that every decision I make is going to be right. Absolutely not. But just ah, maybe that builds a bit of trust in the beginning, which is, I think, valuable when you have a leadership position. Um, and then the point you touched on about them having the secret key to know if I want to make a change, I should figure out how it has these and these features. If I want to convince James, if that's important for getting that thing done, it's not always, of course. Um, but that that's definitely useful. And I think just when we're making, you know, sometimes as a leader, you have to make decisions that go against the consensus. You avoid doing it and, you know, we try and have processes in place where we can get to a consensus and it's not about being a dictator, but sometimes for efficiency sake, we have to move forward. We might have to, you know, disagree and commit on something. And in that, in that case, I think it's really valuable to have, um, the, the words that you need to be able to describe why, why are we doing this? So if I can say, well, I'm choosing a over B, I know some of you disagree, but it's because of you know, and I can go through a few decision principles. I think that has a lot more weight to it than just saying we're going with a, I say, so, you know, that doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't really feel too good, right? Psychologically and psychological safety wise. So that that's not an everyday occurrence, of course, but when you need it, that's valuable. And just, yeah, I just think raising the sort of conscious level around decision-making, I think that's the biggest value. Right. Thank you. Um, it, it sounds like there are many different kinds of benefits to the decision principles and to them being verbalized yes. and to them being so to the point, it's kind of hard to misunderstand when it's not, as you said in the beginning, when it's just innovation in bright, shiny letters, it's much different when it's innovation over safe paths. Um, and now that we have talked about kind of you and your position as a leader and working with decision principles, I am wondering whether or not you use them any differently when it comes to your peers in management or when it comes to communicating with your superiors. Mm, that's a great question. I think I use them less is the honest answer. I think I don't bring them up as often. I'm trying not, I'm trying to sort of ransack myself to figure out why, why that might be. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure why that's a gut feeling I have that I, I, I use them less often. Not that I'm embarrassed about them or that, um, yeah, or ashamed of them in any way. And I'm sure that I have, you know, said, oh, this is my decision principle. And he, I'm just trying to think of the last sort of peer meeting or leadership meeting or board meeting or something where I, I sort of brought them up and nothing is coming to mind. I think it's more that mm, maybe that's not true. At, at, at Griffin, uh, one of the things I introduced was a new product process called shape up, which came out of Basecamp, which is a really awesome process for people who are doing other kind of agile processes. I highly recommend reading Ryan Singer's ebook about it. It's uh, really excellent. And if, when you're introducing something like that, you need to sell it into people. And I, I can't give a specific example, but I'm pretty sure that I would have used some combination of, of the decision principles and words to that effect when I'm sort of selling it in around fast feedback. Uh, or maybe even around innovation, potentially around, you know, differentiating around discovery and just trying to connect them together. I'm sure I didn't just go through and sort of list off my decision principles because that's a bit too <laughs> abrupt, but, um, so maybe a little bit, my gut feeling is a bit less. It's a really interesting question. I haven't really thought about it before. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that, that this might be the answer. It, it almost sounds like when you are talking with your team, then you sort of have to be really conscious about being very direct and kind of 
transparent mm-hmm. in that sense. And seems like when you are with the management, perhaps you are more so on the same page because you see the kind of bigger challenges or, or challenges to the business that maybe the teams that you manage don't see or, mm. or don't have to deal with them as often or as much, but I'm just guessing here. You might be right. But so there's thought- one other interesting corollary here that might be worth bringing up. And that is, I am very transparent about these in a recruitment process when I'm the one looking for a new opportunity. And the reason being is because I think matching values based on the culture of the place that you're potentially joining is really important. And I think these are a really clear indicator of how I think, what my values are, you know, who I am as a person almost. And so, you know, when I spoke to the CEO, I would have brought them up explicitly, gone through them, explained why I have them. Um, Same thing with the CTO. Um, So that's definitely another value of this on that side of the recruitment is seeing if we have alignment. My company's very, uh, Griffin, we're very open about our culture, our, our, our shared values with each other. And my decision principles have almost a one-to-one mapping. The wording is not identical, but you can kind of map my decision principles to the company core values, uh, which is I I actually did that in, in my manager read me to sort of not confuse people and not like I'm off on my own way of thinking. Don't worry about that. You know, they're the same kind of ideas. Right. So there's a huge value there. And then I think I mentioned a bit before on the other side of that recruitment coin, when you're hiring people, I can, I don't need to drone on and up about my decision principles, but I can look out for where they have alignment in, in the thinking where they've been thinking themselves about the importance of, uh, understanding and deciding. So I think on both sides of the recruitment coin, they do add some value and that is where I shared them directly with seniors or peers. Right. Right. Thank you. And one, one other thing that came to my mind with the, with the potential benefits of this is, um, Brene Brown, she, <clears throat> I'm sure you know her, accomplished author, TED speaker and whatnot, um, scientist. And she, there is something that kind of stuck with me from, uh, from her latest book, I think. Um, and she says, clarity is kind. And I feel like having these decision principles for yourself and, and making them so obvious makes it so much easier to communicate and to cooperate within teams and across teams and with you personally and with the people who you manage. I totally agree. Uh, And I love that quote. I'm stealing that from my quote library. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Um, now we know that you also have a quote library. Um, that's, that's really awesome. With that said, um, now we kind of talked about the bigger picture mm-hmm. and, and what the benefits are. Let's get to the nitty gritty. Mm-hmm. How do you use your decision principles in the everyday life? I'm sure there are some engineers who think, okay, so every time I have to decide something, do I get out my decision principles list? Or is there some trigger that I need to look for? What is sort of the, the usual process for using the decision principles? maybe it's good to start with saying what I don't do. So what I don't do is every time I'm faced with a decision, big or small, sort of break out a chart with all the decision principles and, you know, start weighing up. Uh, It's not quite that level of process. It's more when I'm making a decision or we are making a decision as a team, it's often that the words that we use will make me think of one of the decision principles, you know, because I've sort of repeated them enough. They're quite fresh in my mind normally, um, especially some of them. And it, it's just that trigger of, oh, could we be going down one of those, you know, problem choices that I've made, but, you know, are we doing something here where we're not collecting the data on this? We're just making a decision based on opinion. You know, that's a very common um, error case that I've seen time and time again in different organizations, you know, so easy to just think we know this now and to, you know, all the confirmation biases kick in and we think we know what we're doing, but really we should do an experiment on this. Uh, the same thing, it, let's say we're changing something with the process that we're working with again, instead of just straight up changing it, let's treat the change as an experiment. 
let's review that. Let's see, did it help in the way that we hoped? And not just put all of our our weight, all of our confidence in our ability to predict the future. Because in my experience, that's really hard, especially in software. So it's does it make sense? I'm not sure I'm explaining it well. So it's not just boom, 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 go through all of them. It's more use them as when they come to mind, that might be that you're in an area that's either good or potentially dangerous territory, and then use them as a way to think what makes sense in this case. It almost sounds like they are general guidelines, not, not as you said, a chart to a pro con list or, yes. or anything to check off all the time. Yeah. It's, it's more like if you have already made the effort of coming down with your own decision principles, you are already much clearer about what you value and how you make decisions. And then once you have that, you have these guidelines and when you are in, can you say that when you're in a nutcracker, I feel like that might be an expression that I just made up. Anyway, when you are in a difficult mm -hmm. situation and you're faced with a difficult kind of decision or when you've been, you know, thinking about the decision for an elongated period mm -hmm. of time, you think, oh my God, I have these decision principles. Let's weigh my options against my own decision principles. And then that might help me make the best decision with the information that I have. Yeah, and what I've found is it can short circuit, you know, I don't know if you ever do this, but if it feels like a tricky decision, it's quite easy to get stuck in analysis paralysis, where you're just going over and over the different options, weighing up the pros and cons. Uh, what I found the, these principles, and I really like your insight there about, are they more guidelines than principles? I've actually reflected on that myself and considered actually changing principle to guidelines, sort of soften and make it clearer that these are not the law. There is something to help. Um, I should reflect more on that. Um, but that was a bit of an aside. Um, I can't remember the main point that I was trying to make. So what, what say your bit again, and then maybe I'll get back on track to where I was. I was, I was um, kind of musing about how <clears throat> this can help, but not in the kind of, in my understanding, engineering yes. sense of really having it in every decision, mm -hmm. it can more help in the kind of difficult situations when, especially leaders who are faced with, my understanding is decisions on different levels of abstraction, yes. um, they, they have to kind of switch gears very often. And so when they have the decision principles boiled down or, or cleared up, or at least they have something, then these might help them make, if not better decisions, but decisions that they are more comfortable That's with. That's right. And really. I think you've hit on, on a key point there. And a lot of it is about comfort because as a leader, sometimes you're a bit out in the open. Sometimes your neck is exposed, right? And you're making decisions. You know, when I was my first CTO role, when you have to make a decision about the technology stack, it feels like a big responsibility, it feels like you can make a mistake. So I found these helped me with comfort, with feeling like, well, at least I have a reason. If someone asked me, it's not just because I felt like it, you know, I, I can talk about it clearly, I can talk about it crisply, and it feels nice. Doesn't mean you've made the right decision. But I think feeling comfortable is an important part of being a good leader. So uh, I, I think you've really hit the nail on the head there. That's a great insight. And perhaps it's being a good leader is um, making your your people comfortable. And so exactly. if you can manage exactly. to, to be comfortable with your decisions, then your people will be more comfortable with you and with the decisions that they have to follow. 100%. And now decision principle, I feel like in every conversation, I have this point when what we're talking about is just so great and amazing. And why don't we all do it? So let's talk about some of the perhaps mistakes or, or, or the points where maybe decision principles short circuited you or, mm -hmm. or, 
or didn't really help you as much or or some some examples when they didn't work or they didn't work as expected yeah that's that's a great a great question and a great way to balance it because i don't want people to come away with this thinking that i think this is a silver bullet that just fixes everything and makes you the world's best leader just because you have decision principles or guidelines i i don't believe that's true like i said at the beginning i think it's more about adding a particular tool to your toolkit that in some cases might be helpful so just to set that, that context i think that's important um but the, going back to your question about what mistakes i think there there's two ways a sort of general groupings of mistakes that i i've seen myself making and i could potentially see other people making if they tried to apply this and the first one is being too dogmatic you know not treating them as guidelines but just if you if you go with that x over y formulation always picking x uh, because that's not being pragmatic that's not weighing up the different factors that are important in the current situation and just because x worked for you in the past doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be right this time you can't just blindly follow this it is a guideline it's not a rule it's not law so i think dogmatically following them is definitely a trap the other trap i think would be to share them with people and then not follow them at all or not bring them up <laughs> right the, the, the flip side that that's the other mistake <laughs> right because then you're right. not building trust it's not you you mentioned before about the value of clarity and confidence I think that's a big part of being a leader is that clarity and confidence. So I think you do need to be consistent. You do need to be trustworthy. And, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, oh, X over Y for this particular thing that that matches, you can't turn around and say, well, absolutely not, and not give a good reason for it. You, you need to be consistent. And that consistency might be normally I say X over Y, but in this case, we're doing Y and here's here's why because you know the context is different and that's perfectly fine i don't think that's being inconsistent it's just showing flexibility and showing open-mindedness so i think those are the two sort of cases where it could go horribly wrong uh, i think you touched on one where i've personally maybe over applied it sometimes and in some situations and that's innovation over safe bets one of my colleagues shared this concept that i hadn't heard before that uh, as a startup, you have innovation tokens and you shouldn't, let's say you have three or you have five of those. So that, that means that you shouldn't just go all in and try and innovate on every single decision that you make, that you need to balance it with some safe bets. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. So I think in the past, maybe I've been a bit too gung-ho uh, with, with pushing too hard for innovation. I think it's important. I still like the value. I'm wondering, do I word it too strongly? Do I need to rethink that that principle? Um, but in terms of mistakes I've made, and even when it's turned out well, you know, my first CTO role, we we innovated in a lot of areas. You know, we came up with a new architecture that we opened. So, you know, there was a lot of things that could have gone wrong there. And that time they didn't, it worked out well, but that doesn't mean it was the right choice. You know, you can get lucky. So um, yeah, that that's definitely a mistake I've made. Right. And w one other thing that came to my mind is that really what the exact thing that you begin with, most of our decisions are not, you know, the instant feedback kind of thing. And even if they seem, you know, like, okay, it was, this was the best decision I could have made a couple months down the line, perhaps the context changes. And then two years later, you realize, oh my gosh, I could have made a much better decision that yes. time. So really, I feel like, I feel like this comes down to everything, but we shall all aim to make the most informed decisions that are aligned with our values. Mm -hmm with the information that we have and with the circumstance that we are in, and then kind of take comfort in that we did what we could to, to make a good decision and then, and then go with it and course correct if there is need be. I love that. That's a great way of phrasing it. All right.
thank you. <laughs> it just came to my mind and I thought, you know, these decisions are great, but sometimes we can do all that's in our toolkit and then still, you know, later realize it wasn't the best decision, but we are all just people. That's right. And, and we're just trying to learn uh, and, and improve a little bit. That's kind of my philosophy on that is not, of course, you can have heroes or people that you look up to and people that you're comparing yourself to and thinking, well, I'm, you know, I'm not as good as that. I'm never going to be as good as that. But I've actually found it more useful to compare myself to myself in the past and think how far have I come rather than how far do I have left to go? There's plenty left to go, right? But I think there's, it can help with, um, with confidence and just self-esteem to try not to compare yourself to others too much. Compare yourself to yourself right. in the past. Right. Thank you for sharing that. And with that said, I feel like the diary format that you have shared is probably a really great tool for, for that to reflect on one's own progress. Oh my gosh, we have covered so much ground. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to the show. We have talked about decision principles, how one can make their own, what are some of the common mistakes that they can make, um, what are the the benefits of having decision principles, both from when you are seeking a job to when you're hiring, to having common ground with your team, to having um, common understanding about you, to working together with management, a lot of things about decisions. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on and you think it's very important for our listeners to know? It can be anything, doesn't need to be about decisions. Not that I can think of. I think you've asked some absolutely incredible questions and you've made me feel very comfortable and opened up some interesting avenues of, of discussion. I think you've led this in an exemplary way. And I just wanted to thank you because you've actually led me to new insights about this as we're talking, which is uh, not easy. Not, not that it's hard to lead me to, but you just, you managed the conversation in a, in a really nice way. And I really enjoyed talking with you about this. Thank you so much. Thank you for the instant feedback. Oh my gosh, a leader in, uh, in play everyone. Thank you so much. Um, with that said, thank you for joining us dearest watchers and listeners today my guest was james trunk who is vp of engineering at griffin and we talked about decision principles and his decision principles and everything there is to know about decision principles from the two of us um i'm sure if you search on the internet you will find more decision principles with that said james where can our listeners follow your work or get in touch with you if they have any questions i'm not really much on social media so no twitter or anything i try and avoid that um but i am on linkedin which i guess is some kind of social media so if you search for james trunk on linkedin i should be one of the top um so people can reach out to me there i do respond um i try and mainly connect to people i know but if you say oh i saw you on this podcast that would be enough of a connection that i would definitely accept um uh, otherwise, the Griffin blog, I'm sure there'll be stuff coming up on the blog um, from the engineering side. So I'll, I'll try and contribute there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dear as listeners and watchers, um, this is the end of our conversation with James Trunk about decision principles. As I said in the beginning, if you are new here, please go to codingsense.com and sign up for the Level Up Engineering newsletter because you will hear all of our episodes two weeks prior to everyone else, which will give you just the edge, I guess, or just the entertainment. Um, I am Carolina Toth, and I definitely hope to see you next time. Thanks for staying with Level Up Engineering. If you enjoyed this podcast, so will your friends. Share this episode on your favorite social networking platform. To stay up to date with our content, follow Level Up Engineering on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Google Podcast. Brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at codingsans.com.